Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome to this edition of A Reason for Hope. We're delighted that you're here to join us in our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time, a journey we make each and every day at this time, driven and directed by your questions on the Bible. Whether it's a question on a passage in the Bible you'd like to explore, get a little bit more up close and personal, uh, perhaps uh, with a passage that's meant the world to you, or maybe explore one of those ones that has raised more questions for you, that has given you answers. Hey, bring it on. Let's explore God's Word together. You know, it's our vision here at uh, Reason for Hope to go through the entire Bible, one question at the heart at a time. So be a part of uh, helping us on that journey by directing the conversation uh, with those scriptures you'd like to explore. Uh, again, we're looking forward uh, to your comments here. If you're logging on on our famous comment corner, on Facebook, you can get those questions to us and we can answer them in real time. We're available for you on Facebook, by the way, at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. Follow us on Facebook, like us there, and uh, you can join us uh, live each and every day at this time. Uh, perhaps it's personal issues going on in your walk with God. You could use a little guidance and direction straight from God's Word. Hey, uh, let us know what's going on in your life. We'd love to let you know what the Bible has to say about even the most personal issues you are facing. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is to discover how God's Word can really be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Use a little path lightning in your life. Uh, jump on in. Love to hear from you. And uh, boy, what a delight it is to discover that God is more interested in guiding us sometimes than we are being gid, as we say. Again, uh, get those questions to us. If uh, you are joining us on one of our radio affiliates, whether it's Reach Radio here in Tucson, KNKT in Albuquerque, uh, Life FM in Miami, Florida, you can get us a question a couple different ways. Questionsforhope at gmail.com is our email address. If you're more comfortable just sending us an email, you can take advantage of that. Questionsforhope at gmail.com. Or if uh, you would like to uh, use our toll-free number, one 556 one two one two one eight seven seven five five six one two one two and just a note about that that is our uh, google phone uh, application you'll hear a uh, prompt uh, asking you who you want to leave a message for just say a reason for hope and after the beep leave your questions and uh, we can answer them uh, very very quickly we've got text to speech uh, on uh, that uh, particular app and uh, we can uh, monitor your questions as those come on in. Joined here by my right-hand man, protege, I'll run good guy, uh, Sean Richard. Sean, thanks uh, so much for you and uh, Peter Martin taking Friday and uh, yesterday's uh, broadcast. Really appreciate that. It's good to have you back. Well, it's good to be back. Why don't you open us up in a word of prayer? Happy to. Dad, thank you that we have the chance to gather together. And as we can share your word, I pray that that would be exactly what's spoken, shared, and taken away from this gathering continue to be the focus of not only what we're pursuing out of this time spent, but even more importantly, what we are recognizing, and what we're receiving as a, the treasure that it is. Please just make not only your words clear to us, but allow us to seek for opportunities to apply them personally and to draw closer to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. I like this question. This is from S.A. from Ezekiel 3626. When it says, I will give you a heart of flesh, does that mean the Lord will make us more tender and sympathetic towards others? Yes and no, S.A. When it's speaking of a heart of flesh, understand what it's contrasted by, a heart of stone. Now, stone is, among other things, it is made of material. And if it's in the shape of a heart, then basically all it has in common with the heart is that shape, but no function. Right. And the emphasis of that prophecy is comparing what was formed Formerly, and this was fulfilled literally with the nation of Israel, but also shown in the work that God was going to do through Ezekiel and every other time he uses his word in a generation, a valley of dry bones, which were not just not tender or unsympathetic towards each other. I don't know about the social lives of skeletons, but I'm pretty sure they're uh, callous. Uh, it was referring to them not being alive, not in any way able to relate, receive, or show the thing they were created to do. And dead as doornails. Yeah, yeah, not be dead. Yeah. So in this, st in this state, uh, God told Ezekiel, S prophesy to those dry bones, and they became living bodies, but they didn't have a spirit in them. Then he spoke the spirit, then they became living. 
Now this, of course, is paralleled by Genesis, but when he then goes on to say, I will, and this was following through on this prophecy and would follow up on it as well, take from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, it was this same point. I'll take you in a state of being dead and make you alive again. That's what is, uh, Ezekiel Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about when it says, you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. It didn't say that uh, you were uh, in need of some good social reform, and uh, once you were able to be more sympathetic towards others, then God could use you. No, it was that transition from life to death, from having a stone-cold heart, something that isn't beating like a rock, and something that actually functions, that is alive. Now note, if uh, you adopt the heart of Jesus Christ, you're naturally going to want to care about others. But when we're talking about this issue of that transition, I think the emphasis is more on life versus non-living material. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, the, the main point is being alive in your relationship with God. There's a neat parallel passage in uh, Jeremiah chapter 32 uh, in verse 38, where it says, uh, they shall be my people, referring to Israel, and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good. I will put my fear in their hearts so that they do not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will surely plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Now, there's a lot of mention of the heart there. The, the word heart in Hebrew, lev, uh, not only refers to, say, the seat of emotions as we would understand it in our culture, but it, it refers to the heart of one's being, uh, really the essence of, uh, of who someone is. It, it carries over into our language in expressions like that was a heartfelt expression. It wasn't just something that was emotional. It was a totally sincere, all-encompassing gesture, we would mean if we use that phrase. Well, what God is saying is, is that uh, he is going to do a work within his people where they are going to serve him, not just with their mind, uh, agreeing, say, to a certain set of uh, creeds about God, uh, not just with uh, external observances, uh, spiritual to-do list, but with the totality of their being, with the totality of a relationship, with everything that God intended for us to experience from the beginning. He created us for a love relationship with him, and that idea of serving him from the heart is really uh, woven into all of that. So a very beautiful expression. It ain't a rock, so yeah. that was the point of the parable. It's the rock it. that won't roll you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, a uh, question from Mike who wants to know, what do we make of dreams and visions uh, that people seem to be having a lot recently? As it says in the Bible, your young men will have visions, your old men will dream dreams. In the end times, how can we know these visions and dreams are of God? Well, that's the real kicker there. Uh, one more follow-up question as well from Craig who wants to know, what age is old? as far as those who would cross into that category of dreams. I was uh, sent a video uh, before airtime regarding an individual, uh, his name was, uh, the individual who sent me the video, his name was Christopher, but uh, people claiming I got three prophetic dreams that I had to share with the world, and of course they were exactly what you'd expect given that format. But how do we, as First Thessalonians would state, test all things and hold fast to what is good? What is our metric when we hear a dream and obviously don't want to despise it, but know what to test it with. Yeah, I think a really good place to start, and that's an excellent question because it seems like more and more people are playing fast and loose with the, oh, I had a dream and it must be spiritually significant. So, you know, great way to sell books or get on Christian TV is to uh, publish these dreams and the more lurid, the better, in a sense. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 13, it warns of this possibility, even back during the days of Moses. It says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you've not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God 
who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put the evil from your put away the evil from your midst. Well, there we see a very interesting thing that uh, these dreams uh, are serious things. If someone says, I've received a dream from God, it's like uh, modern day prophets uh, who say things like, thus saith the Lord. Man, you are, you know, you're taking on a lot when you, you say that. Uh, we become kind of cavalier uh, about throwing that label on a lot of things. There's a devotional that's really popular called Jesus Calling, uh, which has some really nifty little uh, positive mental attitude boosters and, you know, bon mots from Scripture and so on. But the disturbing thing to me is is that Jesus' calling is couched in a thus saith the Lord kind of a, a thing. It's Jesus saying, uh, this is Jesus' word for you today. I love you and I want to bless you and da-da-da-da-da. Well, you know, all well and good, but did Jesus really say that? Um, you know, is it something that he would say uh, under a set of circumstances? If a person, say, for instance, is going through a rough time uh, because God is disciplining them, allowing them to experience some spiritual skin knees to turn back to him, would reading something like that says, oh, don't worry, you know, everything's great. You know, is that really from the Lord? Now, I know a lot of people have been blessed by Jesus Calling and its subsequent follow-ups, but I get real nervous about that because to say this is a message from God or I have a word from the Lord from you, uh, you know, you can see how seriously it was taken back then. You know, the number one way to test these things is this. Does it point us to the true God of the Bible, the God as he is revealed in the scripture? Does it cause us to become more dependent upon dreams and visions and uh, supernatural phenomena or does it cause us to become more dependent and more founded uh, upon the Word of God. Do we find ourselves uh, kind of getting into the old, uh, I remember the slogan for Lay's potato chips, bet you can't eat just one. Well, sometimes with these visions and, and dreams and stuff, uh, you know, people will have one and then it's kind of a, can you top this sort of thing? You know, people will ask sometimes, you know, with some of the uh, more bizarre uh, phenomena that say uh, accompanied say the Toronto blessing and the Brownsville revival and others where people were uh, barking like dogs and clucking like chickens and uh, claiming that God was taking silver fillings and making them into gold and and so forth we you go how in the world do people get that out there well here's the deal a little bit at a time you've got to keep upping the ante if that's what you're selling people okay we've gathered here tonight and I know the Lord's got a word for us and a magic uh, supernatural thing or a vision or a dream and we're gonna just wait on the Lord for that. well okay how do you know that the Lord has that for you tonight it's kind of presumptuous and uh, when you start uh, getting into this okay uh, you know God did something really amazing last week a bunch of people fell over when a guy waved his uh, sport coat over him uh, you know we've seen that you know uh, you know okay well what have you done for us lately and so you have to keep upping the ante and upping the ante and upping the ante and before too long normally very reasonable people are running around barking like dogs and clucking like chickens because the scripture says let everything hath breaths praise the Lord so I think that's in context. Yeah. So you, know, you got to be really careful with this sort of thing. You know, even in the book of Colossians, uh, Paul warned the uh, church in Colossae that there would come people that uh, would come and offer doctrines. That uh, he says in Colossians chapter two. Uh, you know, I I could start at verse uh, sixteen to give you the the context here. It says, "Let no one judge you in food or drink." regarding to a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you out of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with an increase that is from God." In other words, there's going to be people that are going to try to, uh, you know, sell you a message. And they're going to say, well, I had this special dream and so forth. Now, does that mean that God can't speak through dreams? No, absolutely. It says in the last days that's going to happen. Uh, does it say that that's impossible? No. 
But it does say that we are to not despise prophecies, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19, but to test all things and to hold fast what is good. How do you test it? You say, okay, uh, interesting dream. Where is that in the Word of God? If it's a, a dream that predicts, say, a future event that is going to take place, did the future event actually come to pass? And uh, is it uh, something that uh, the individuals are willing to put themselves on the line and say, you know, if this doesn't come to pass, uh, you know, please, you know, discipline me as a false prophet. I've spoken it presumptuously in the name of the Lord, but I really believe this is going to happen. Um, no, you know, we're not talking about taking people out and stoning them, but we are talking about church discipline. Uh, you know, we are talking about someone coming up and owning up to being a false prophet or a, a dreamer of dreams. It's just interesting to me how when these things happen, there's always an out. Uh, back during the 1984 Olympics in L.A., I was working as a uh, graveyard shift security guard at the water polo venue in, at Pepperdine. And a big to-do got going because um, uh, a, a Christian radio station, a uh, very popular talk show in L.A., had this couple on who said that they'd received a vision, a dream from God, that there was going to be a huge earthquake in Southern California during the Olympics and that Christians needed to, you know, put aside supplies and stuff so that we could be a witness during this predicted earthquake. Well, predicting an earthquake in Southern California, that's not any great shakes. There's going to be a thunderstorm in Arizona during summer. Yeah, it's something it's kind of like that. Yeah. But they said there was going to be this massive earthquake and, and so on. Well, the... Summer Olympics came and went, no earthquake, and they just said, oh, well, it was because God's people prayed, and that's why the earthquake didn't happen. So, you know, I, really? You know, so, uh, you know, if someone comes to you with a dream or a vision, and then it doesn't come to pass, and they've always got an out, and they've always got a, you know, uh, you know, well, this is why, and, and so on, you know, I would take any further input that you get from them with a real grain of salt. Uh, anybody that would say, you know, in a word of prophecy, thus saith the Lord, uh, you know, if they don't have a, an air, I guess, of like fear and trembling yeah. when they say it, um, you know, if it's just cavalier, oh, God, you know, told me where to find a parking place at Target earlier today and things like, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a little skeptical about that. But uh, the, the, the bottom line is, if you see that kind of attitude, be very leery about it. And if, uh, you know, you hear somebody who's had a dream and you think it's legit, um, check it out according to Scripture. And you don't have to fold, spindle, or mutilate the Bible in order to make it fit. It's going to definitely line up with the Word of God. So got to be really careful with that because there's uh, all kinds of hucksters and spiritual charlatans out there that know how to talk the God talk, even the Jesus talk and uh, want you to join their little group or send them money or are looking for fame and fortune and ego. And uh, all it takes is kind of knowing how to you know, play the game, so to speak. Uh, we, we, we don't want to be so cynical uh, because we've been burned, and I've been burned by these things before, that we throw out the possibility that God can do it. But if God's going to do it, he's going to make sure it lines up specifically with his word to the uh, crossing the T's and dotting of the I's. So let's be uh, uh, critical spiritual consumers like the Berean believers in Acts 17.11 uh, where uh, we we're told that they were more noble-minded than those at Thessalonica for they received the word with eagerness and searched the scriptures daily to find out if these things were really so. Well, what things? The things even Paul was telling them. So if they were commended for checking things out, I think that's a pretty uh, good high sign for us that we should check things out too. All right. A uh, question from Kurt, who wants to know about anointing somebody with oil. If we could elaborate on that. Yeah, Kurt, it's a very common reference in the Bible, and it usually appears in one of two ways. It's either prepping someone for office, or it's associated with prayer, sometimes both. Uh, say, for example, the title of the Messiah. That is where we get our word Christ from. And uh, what's interesting about that is when someone was a Messiah in the Old Testament, the word literally means an anointed one. Anointed with what? Well, generally with oil. Uh, when, say for example, a political leader like a king was to be called in 1 Samuel, we see that David was anointed as the king of Israel. He was literally the Messiah king. Uh, the prophet Samuel anointed him with oil, and literally it wasn't like you know taking a little dab and uh, doing a little Simba mark on the forehead. <laughs> he just dunked the whole thing on him and yeah. just let the kid kind of wallow there in his stickiness for a little bit. But uh, another example, an earlier one, was 
was when a priest was prepared for his ministry. In the book of Leviticus, the priests, in order to prepare for serving in the temple or the tent of God at the time, uh, they needed to take not only a bath, but have a little bit of a perfume treatment. They would get a very special kind of oil and be anointed with it. And it was that same thing. In fact, uh, right. I believe it's uh, Psalm 133. The whole thing, uh, well, it makes two illustrations, but one of which was describing how when Aaron was anointed, it was uh, pouring down his beard. And that's, that's pretty copious given the Middle Eastern stereotype. Yeah, yeah. But uh, also note, a third kind of individual, as kind of mentioned along with all of this as well, is prophets. When they were anointed for that office, they were recognized and tested as such. They would anoint them with oil and set them aside with that sort of title. So prophets, people who spoke on behalf of God, kings, those who represented God's authority, and of course, when it's referring to prophets, kings, and what was the third one? I was... I'm uh, having a brain fart here. Priests. Priests, yes. Yeah. Uh, those who met in the middle, who mediated between a relationship with God. Now, Jesus was the Messiah because he fit all three. He was our king, he is our great high priest, and he is our uh, pr- a prophet. He's the one who speaks on behalf of He's the of embodiment God. of God's word. Yeah. yeah, he can obviously speak for God since he's God. But um, all that being said, that's one of the applications. The other is found in a few places, but James is the most direct. In chapter 5, in verse 15, or actually, let's start in verse 14, it says, If is anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, generally, people stop here and say, uh, we better take down this video for misinformation. They're preaching another coronavirus cure. No, keep reading. What is that that cures them? Is it the oil? It says, verse 15, and the prayer of faith right. will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And then goes on to clarify the example with Elijah. He prayed, and that faith is what caused the weather, not oil in any capacity. Yeah. But it was supposed to be a representation of, and in this context, as well as others, uh, the three that we mentioned beforehand, the king, the priest, and the prophet. I remembered at that time. It was a picture of the Holy Spirit, and that's generally what this common theme for oil is in the Bible. When someone was anointed, they were given the filling of the Holy Spirit. And the uh, emphasis on this in Jesus' life was at the baptism of John when the Spirit descended upon him as a dove. He was anointed by the Spirit and equipped for his ministry. So that's uh, how oil generally appears in Scripture. Yeah, to- yeah, there's a real vivid uh, kind of a defining thing as far as oil being likened to the ministry of God's Holy Spirit. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 4, uh, it uh, talks about a vision that Zechariah saw. He said, I'm, with, I'm looking and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at the left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? The angel who talked with me answered, said, Do you not know what these are? And he said, No, my lord. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone, that is the capstone of the temple, uh, with shouts of grace, grace to it. Uh, it, It's uh, further defined in verse 11. It says, And I answered, said, What are these two olive trees, the right stand and the left? Uh, And I further answered and said to him, What are those two olive branches that drip into the receptacles, the two gold pipes from which the gold oil drains? He says, Do you not know what those are? And he said, These are the two anointed ones. Again, that term uh, the, of the anointed, the Mashiach, who stand be- beside the Lord of the whole earth. So here you see this vision of uh, these two anointed individuals, Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the, the uh, governor of Israel. They would be anointed by the power and spirit of God. And so this uh, kind of uh, Rube Goldberg sort of looking contraption where you have olive trees pouring forth their oil into these receptacles that go down into a menorah-like structure that burns brightly with the light of God. It's an image of the fact that uh, anything significant is not done by might or by power, but by God's Spirit. So that's why we would define that anointing as a picture of the ministry and power of the Spirit of God. And uh, just to clarify, Craig wants to know what exactly is the age for the dreams vision cutoff point? Uh, I I'll throw a guess, maybe over 30. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's in the eye of the beholder. You know, Craig, I've, I can remember uh, there were times where I'd hear about someone dying in their 30s and 
think, oh, they live to be a good old age. Uh, you know, now uh, I hear about somebody dying uh, in their early 80s, and I'm like, oh, they were so young, you know. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's somewhat flexible. Uh, you know, I think uh, young men uh, tends to carry the idea of up to 30, your older men probably beyond all of that. Yeah, and uh, real real quick before we get to this next question, uh, Carlos, great question here, but this one I think could be addressed pretty straightforwardly. Um, oh, I won't, I won't mention the name, but an individual uh, was wondering why it's difficult to get most churches to do this sort of James routine of uh, having the elders come and pray for you, get the oil and stuff. We have it available, but given recent circumstances, what was the real emphasis of that passage? Was it the massage and juice or was it was it the prayer that's the most important yeah aspect. you know i you know the reason that we under normal optimal circumstances will if someone comes up and they're sick and uh, they they want to follow through on what james said about uh, having the elder to the church anointing the person with oil uh, we'll do that why because the scripture says to do that um, there's probably a lot more uh, to life than meets the eye uh, you know i'm not going to uh, you know say that because i don't understand all of the ramifications involved with that, uh, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to walk by faith, and if God's Word says to do it that way, we do it that way. Uh, you know, in a condition like this where you can't uh, get anointed with oil because of uh, the pandemic and so forth, you know, God's got that covered. Um, you know, he's, he's still a God who heals. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that is one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is there are churches that I think are in reaction uh, to uh, say more charismatic churches, ones that lay a great emphasis on healing because they've been burned or there've been excesses and so forth. Uh, you know, it's like there's a popular uh, radio uh, pastor who writes books bagging on the charismatic movement on a regular basis. And, uh, you know, they, they mock, you know, the excesses uh, that are involved with it. And, you know, when I read the mockery of the excesses, uh, sometimes I think they've got a point because there's a lot of really bad stuff that goes on there, a lot of bad, unbiblical stuff that goes on there. But that doesn't mean that everything they do is bad and unbiblical. Uh, it doesn't mean that every uh, manifestation of the miraculous is something that uh, we need to avoid. Uh, you know, God is a miracle-working God. You know, the uh, people who take the cessationist uh, side of things that say the ministry of the, the Holy Spirit uh, isn't really doing anything as far as miracles are concerned. Why don't we see miracles all over the place? Uh, one of the arguments about healing that I used to hear quite a bit was if the biblical gift of healing is still in effect, why aren't these healers going in and clearing out the hospitals? Well, I, you know, thoroughly agree with uh, the, the whole notion that a lot of faith healers have preyed upon the fears and the pain of individuals and exploited them uh, horribly. And uh, they're going to stand before God someday as, and give an account for all of that. But to say, you know, why aren't these people going into the hospitals and clearing them all out? I never see the apostles doing that. Um, you know, to say that if you've got the gift of healing every time someone's sick, you can pray for them and they will be healed carte blanche uh, doesn't make any sense to me because in first timothy chapter 5 and verse 18 uh, the apostle paul told timothy to have a little wine uh, and not drink only water because of his stomach ailments and his, his frequent illnesses. And this just as an aside note, hospitals weren't invented yet until Christians and their cultural presumptions dominated the culture and society. But, but, having, but even having that, they, they had doctors and so forth. Dr. Luke was one of them. But uh, the, the long and the short of it is, is that God heals according to his will back then in the book of Acts, just like he does now. And, you know, just for us to say, well, that can't happen anymore, I think is foolish. Any more than to say that every single time someone is sick, uh, there's got to be a supernatural intervention or you don't have faith. I'll tell you, one of the, the real uh, difficult moments that I had with my cancer uh, situation was when a very sincere person came up to me and said, uh, you know, after I told the church I was going in, uh, for uh, my surgery at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, this person pulled me aside and said, you know, I think that's a step away from faith and God's not going to honor that in your life. And you really need to reconsider. God just wants to heal you uh, miraculously and supernaturally. 
And, uh, you know, I said, well, I, I believe that God uses doctors. And I, you know, I quoted in that passage and they said, oh, you just aren't having enough faith in your faith. And I'm like, well, oh, man. And I have no doubt that this person was extremely sincere in what they were saying. But I'm here to tell you that God did use doctors in my case uh, to effect a, a wonderful and beautiful healing. And as a result of that and the, the twists and turns that uh, we were able to go on, we got an opportunity, say, for instance, to share the Lord with the medical team that worked on me. Uh, I think there was some really good fruit that came out of all of that. So, you know, does God heal supernaturally, miraculously? I've seen it, um, experienced it, uh, you know, even in a categorical sense with uh, some of the, the worst uh, kind of uh, diseases you can mention. My own dad being miraculously healed of uh, lymphoma cancer and that bringing him to a greater healing uh, his coming to know the lord you know verified by you know his uh, very unspiritual oncologist god does do miraculous things but you know when we look at the book of acts how often on average did miracles happen in the book of acts well we have about oh i believe 17 uh maybe more or less recorded in the whole book over a span of 30, 35 years. So that's maybe one every year if you... One every two years, yeah. yeah. So that sounds about right, yeah. given what we observe. <laughs> but here's the deal, and, and I want you all to understand this. Uh, you know, if you need a miracle in God's economy, you've got it. God's arm isn't short. Uh, his ear isn't dull that he can't hear you when you call. He is a God that will use all kinds of wonderful ways to affect... Uh, his healing, sometimes in a miraculous way. It's all about displaying his beauty, as uh, Peter Martin was uh, so wonderfully speaking about this. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the glory of God, we, we tend to uh, ooky spooky that into some other category, but God wants to show how beautiful he really is, and he can do that in a lot of different ways. So if you need a miracle, don't be afraid to ask for one. Uh, but uh, bring your need before the Lord, and just like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, just uh, say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You know what you're doing. You know your business, God. I want to trust you more with this and not less, and I don't want to tell you your business. Uh, however you want to, to deal with this, uh, or if uh, you're going to give me the patience just to endure, I give it to you, and I guarantee you, you walk in that kind of faith, it's going to bring a smile to the face of God, and it's going to bring blessing to your life. All right, a question from Carlos, who wants to know, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verses 9 through 11, especially 11, it sounds scary to him. Uh, what are our thoughts about what we will receive according to the judgment seat of Christ? Well, let oh. me read the scripture, and then you can co comment there, Sean. Right. Uh, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 9, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, that is, whether here or uh, before the Lord, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what is done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, and we are, but we are well known by God, and I trust we're well known in your consciences. So, all right, so. so I guess the, the, the real scary words here uh, are this. Uh, we're going to receive uh, the things done in the body, according to what we've done, whether good or bad. What does that mean? It, is, it doesn't mean that uh, we're going to have to go through a thumbs up or thumbs down kind of judgment when we see the Lord. Well, that's noting a comparison between, say, for example, Revelation 20 and the great white throne judgment, where everyone whose names have not been written in the book of life are cast in the lake of fire. But if you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ, you have right. to ask, first of all, is this a throne of judgment in a court sense or in another sense? Now, we clarify many times in the broadcast that a working knowledge of the biblical languages won't necessarily take away from anything you'd read plainly from the text, but it can add some insights if you're willing to do the extra work. Now, note, no passage in Scripture cannot be understood in its plain context without a understanding of the languages. I think that's phrased properly. Yeah. But but when I'll make sure I get my English straight too. Yeah. But when we're talking about judgment, this isn't judgment concerning the uh, court hearing. 
say for example, it's actually referring to judgment in the sense of an Olympic reward stand. They're judging your performance. Uh, your toes were curled, but I'll still give you a 9.3 because your form was solid. It's that sort of judgment. Because when people think judgment, especially in the context of God, they think it's a determining factor. But the word judgment doesn't necessarily mean determine. It means conclusion. And if I come to good conclusions, that's as much judgment as me coming to conclusions about your salvation. So what's the good and the bad being talked about here? Well, in the context and as well in the languages, we can get into that in a little bit, it's speaking of the good, meaning the useful, and the bad, meaning the not useful. Or uh, uh, Levi Lusco made the comparison of, say for example, a present and the wrapping paper. You get the wrapping out right. of the way because that's not useful, but what you want is within that paper. Uh, this follows nicely from 1 Corinthians, same author and same audience, uh, chapter 3, where Paul says there are things that we build on this life, this precious foundation of salvation, some of wood, hay, and straw, others of gold, silver, and precious stones. If you build it wood, hay, and straw, then in reference to Isaiah 38, Eight, I believe, uh, the consuming eyes of the Lord, the eyes like fire that are repeated again in Revelation, will consume that up. That will be judged as bad to get to the present that is you, that will enter into heaven. But on the other hand, the wood, or not the wood, hey, the gold, silver, and precious stones will be refined in that fire. They will be made perfect and removed from all the impurities that even the good things we do in this life can have some ulterior motives too. So when it comes to the works that God does in us, those will be rewarded. When right. it comes to the things that well, we just kind of did, those will be removed from us and won't be something that affects us in eternity any longer. They'll be taken from our character and judged on the cross. Now, note that point then, if you're standing before Jesus, what then is the conclusion? Well, he says in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But, and then we, know, we are well known to God. So he's speaking to an audience that are already known by God, but have a terror of him. Now, we think, oh, Tower of Terror, Disneyland, your stomach going into your brain and all that kind of stuff. No, the terror there is actually an important word to understand in the way it was originally meant to be understood. We think terror as in terrifying. It inspires fear. But terror just means to have an awe and respect for something. Uh, I'm uh, terrified of spiders. It's not because I necessarily have a personal experience seeing someone eaten alive by the eight-legged freaks or something. It's referring... None of you remember that movie? Yeah, I remember that. But that's referring to that idea of, I want a positive relationship with that creature in as least a complicated way as possible. A better example would be snakes. I love snakes, but I don't go around picking them up. Why? Because I know that's going to make them mad, and their reaction will negatively affect me. I want to be on positive terms with them. So if I know enough about Jesus that he's going to look over my life one day, am I going to live in light of that fact? or try to hide certain things about my life and see what I can get away with. And that was the mentality that Paul debunked in Romans 6.1, where he says, how can we who died to sin live any longer in it? It's repeating this perspective. I live in light of the fact that I respect God enough, not only to not want to break his heart, but taking him seriously enough that he wants to reward me and not taking advantage of the fact that I can stand before him in mercy let alone not in wrath, and that's the difference in judgment. Yeah, I mean, even that uh, expression there, terror, uh, Carlos, sometimes you go, oh my gosh, terrified of the Lord. Hey, stop and think about it for just a second. Uh, if you or I saw one of the angels, say, straight out of the book of Ezekiel, uh, you know, just appearing to us while we were standing out looking at the stars in the backyard, uh, we'd probably freak out. We've never seen anything like this, and the description goes on and on. Uh, you know, the, the four living creatures are before the throne in the book of Revelation. You know, one like a man, one like an ox, one like a lion, one like a flying eagle, with eyes all over them. Uh, you know, I'd look at that and go, whoa, man, that would freak me out. I'd be kind of scary just seeing one of these four living creatures because they're so different from anything I've ever experienced. Well, you remember the Apostle John, when he saw the glorified Jesus on the island of Patmos, he fell at his feet as though he were a dead man. 
In other words, even Jesus, who he was so close to, he was like leaning up against uh, his shoulder at the Last Supper. You know, he described himself over and over again as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, seeing Jesus in his glory just uh, knocked the spiritual wind uh, out of the Apostle John. You know, and uh, so this idea of fear or even intense fear, translated accurately, terror in this particular passage, is really apt because the higher our view of God and how awesome and amazing he is, it's going to do two things to us. Number one, the higher your view of God, it's interesting how the height of your view of God is also going to determine the height of how consistent you are in terms of your morality before God. If uh, Jesus is just your pal, your buddy, you know, somebody you kind of put one over on, you know, you can just sort of leave him in the corner over there. Or, you the know, man you, upstairs. You can kind of fool him. Uh, well, then that's going to affect the way you live morally. But if you realize who you're dealing with, when you're dealing with the true and living God, that uh, he is uh, awesome in his glory, that even the angels themselves uh, are, are constantly saying, you know, glorious, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In other words, there's no one like him. There's nothing like him. Uh, even these awesome beings are in awe of him. So if we have that same sense of awe, it's also going to do an amazing work in terms of the appreciation that the, the highest one, the most high God, the Holy One who is greater than anything we've ever seen in all the creation, as awesome as those things are, uh, loves us and uh, and cares for us with an everlasting love. And if you have that balance in your life, uh, a beautiful uh, uh, benefit accrues to us. In uh, the book of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, we read this, And now little children abide in him, in other words, abide in that relationship with him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now notice there's a possibility of people being ashamed at his coming. Uh, I think that works out in a couple of ways. You know, the uh, when the Jesus movement was going on, one of the things that we used to hear quite a bit is, do you really want to be doing that when the rapture happens? Uh, you know, uh, if I really believe the Lord could come at any moment, it's going to have an impact on the moral decisions that I make. You know, because I don't want to be in the midst of something that is really going to suspect or shaky or downright evil, and then suddenly, oh, there you are, Lord. Uh, you know, that's an example of that. The other side of it is, is that if we abide in him, now notice that abiding word there. It talks about an ongoing relationship. It talks about, you know, putting your tent stakes down. It talks about setting up shop. It's not just a hit and miss. You know, if we abide with him in him and his word abides in us, uh, in John chapter 15, Jesus said, you're going to bear much fruit and that fruit's going to remain. You know, if we're just Sunday Christians or hit and missers, you know, or, you know, well, I gave my life to the Lord and, you know, I'm just going to hang on till he... Uh, gets back. Well, we're going to look at the life that we lived and, you know, I think we are going to feel, you know, a bit ashamed. That is the shame in not having uh, more to show from this life that we lived in. You know, I really believe one of the things that's going to hit all of us when we see the Lord in all of his glory, when we're there and in eternal life, is there's going to probably be a sense of going, wow, in light of seeing you as you really are, Lord, in light of how awesome and, and amazing you are, in light of how loving and glorious and beautiful you really are. Wow, Lord, why didn't I invest more of my time pursuing the things of you? You know, nobody's going to care about the score of the ball game. Nobody's going to care about the credit rating. Nobody's going to care about all the stuff we own. Uh, all that's going to matter is uh, the things that the Lord did in and through us. So, you know, if I invest, you know, my time, talent, and treasure in things that aren't going to last, I think there's an old saying that, you know, life's like a coin. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. And uh, just like money, uh, our lives can either be spent, you know, we can spend our time, we can waste our time, or we can invest our time for the kingdom of God and eternal things. And so I think we have that high view that's going to keep us out of a peck of trouble. Yeah, and if you're wondering what specifically in Scripture it says we can be rewarded for, there are five crowns mentioned, but three are kind of all in tandem one thing. Uh, first of all, faithful service. 
what you're called and equipped to do in life, that you are not only trusted with that, but trustworthy with that calling, that you pursue it in excellence. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25, he uses the illustration of a sports runner to note that they run for a perishable crown, but us for an imperishable crown. Uh, the next three, which are all basically the same thing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, 2 Timothy 4, 8, and 1 Peter 5, 4, all mention the crown of glory, righteousness, and rejoicing. And it's all referring to the person who's looking forward to the coming of Jesus. So if you want to get three and one on that deal, then yeah. <laughs> just uh, keep that sort of perspective. And then uh, lastly, Revelation 2.10, the crown of life is waiting for those who endure persecution for Jesus, yeah. whether they give their life or not. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and uh, awesome uh, rewards there. Hey, uh, just one follow-up uh, I wanted to give on uh, uh, Pam and Tim's a question there. Uh, they they state, I have been asked to be prayed over by elders, as in James, uh, but that hasn't happened. I haven't asked you. Well, I don't know where you are uh, in terms of where you're watching this broadcast, but if you are in the greater Tucson, Arizona area, please come by the church. We'll be happy to uh, pray for you, as the scripture uh, indicates. Uh, and uh, if you are anywhere else, uh, there are all kinds of Calvary chapels that will be more than happy to follow through on doing this uh, according to God's word. I would just really encourage you uh, to go to calvarychapel.com. Uh, you can uh, find an icon on the, uh, the opening page saying find a church and uh, just uh, find one in your area. Call them up and uh, let them know you uh, need prayer. And uh, I, if they're a Calvary Chapel worth their salt, they'll be more than happy to do that. Yeah, it, it'll be a bit of a drive for you. We're about maybe 15, 20 minutes out. Hopefully that's vague enough not to be considered doxing, but from our fellowship and about 20 from Robert Furrow. So you can take your pick, but uh, understand the point of emphasis that James was making was the prayer in faith. That's the key detail and aspect of all of this. The yeah, oil and, is more and, ceremony. And we, we always get a real kick out of meeting our uh, reason for hope. Uh, audience. Uh, it's just always such a blessing to uh, face to face it. Uh, so, uh, you know, come on out uh, during our, you can come for our Oasis service uh, uh, on uh, Wednesday nights or our three services on Sunday morning, and uh, we'll be available to pray for you if, if that's uh, what you need, if that would be a blessing to you. So. Okay. Um, question from Adam, who wants to know what the significance of the book of Enoch is. Uh, the book of Enoch is actually... Well, we get asked that question a lot. Yeah, yeah. History Channel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There are five books, and they're found in what are called the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha are a collection of inter... Uh, testamental writings or deuto, deuterocanonical writings. Now, deuteros meaning secondary canon. Secondary means, to the uh, canon of Scripture. Yeah, and that uh, canon means a measuring rod, so what measures up to. So they kind of got the second place, which is really last place. But the good news is, especially for the first, authors... First loser. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the f good news is, for the author's sake, they never claimed for them to be Scripture, but they were written during this time in which God was speaking. Now, uh, some of them are really, really... Weird. Inter well, I'd, I'd say interesting. Say, for example, uh, First Maccabees records the guerrilla campaign that uh, Judas yeah. Maccabeus uh, did against the Greek occupiers during that time. Gives a little background to the uh, holiday known as Hanukkah, which is affirmed in Scripture, by the way. The Festival of Lights was something Jesus observed. Um, also note that there are others that are just, again, as you said, downright weird. There was a, a incident where um, Solomon, say, for example, has to use his uh, special ring to uh and he throws it at the chest of this demon that has control over water and uh he needs that to get like the mud and mortar all set up for the construction of the temple and stuff and, and it gets really mystical and then there's uh tobit who lost his eyesight by keeping his eyes open while a bird repeatedly pooped in it uh, why i needed to not, know that i don't not know, making but. this up <laughs> so with all of that said, uh, these books were written during a time in which first century Jewish culture would have just appreciated them in the same way that we would enjoy Marvel comics. They used familiar names and settings and backgrounds, in particular the individual named Enoch who lived during the time of Noah. And it records his adventures and interactions with these angels that aren't named anywhere in the Bible, but nonetheless are kind of just there doing their thing. Uh, they read into certain passages and say, oh yeah, this was the angel that did that, or this 
this and so on. It would have about as much historical clout, however, for those of you who watch superhero movies as saying, uh, oh, the Winter Soldier, he was responsible for the JFK assassination or something. That That's a fictional integration, but it doesn't mean that that's actually what happened in history. It's a fictional narrative, and it was advertised as such. Now, it doesn't mean that Enoch wasn't a real person, but that in of itself shows just how significant it is to us. Uh, you can read it if you want some interesting mystical lore. I'm not against that. I have plenty of sci-fi hobbies and fantasy stuff, it, but it'd be about as edifying as Lord of the Rings, because Enoch was around, again, before the time of Noah actually during some of it as well. And when Noah was around and kicking, that was, well, that was before we had any of the books of the Bible. So either Enoch really, really got his act together in putting together these five narratives and books uh, would have been around 4,000 years after the time that God took him. Or these people just used his name. In which case, that is failing one of the tests in which we judge something belongs in Scripture or not. Uh, a good example to compare it to as far as criticism is concerned are the Gospels of Thomas and Judas. Now, Judas and Thomas, they get a lot of attention on Nat Geo and the History Channels, the secret lost Gospels of the New Testament. The problem is, first of all, let's, let's just talk about the main problem. You don't have to go farther than the title to realize they're lying in order to get attention. Why? Well, the early church, the people who were going off of the eyewitness testimony of the first Christians, which we're doing too, by the way, uh, realized that if I use these people's names in my book, it's going to get more attention than if I just wrote it. So in order to promote this cult, which was known as Gnosticism in that time, uh, they basically put forward these Gospels, the 144 sayings of Jesus and the Gospel of Thomas, the hidden sayings, they called it. That was what the Gnostics really banked on. Uh, you read it and you realize this guy was smoking something and it wasn't FDA approved. When we're talking about a gospel, you can not only read and recognize it, but when was the earliest copy of Thomas written again? It was around maybe... 180. Mid okay, now yep. when do we have at least the tradition of Thomas's death in India? Maybe the late 50s? Yeah. And that that's being uh, very guesstimationly. So either Thomas was in such great shape that he managed to not only, after being executed in India, but get his uh, bearing together, so to speak, and 120 years later put together a collection of writings of all the saints he forgot to mention that Jesus talked about, which, by the way, have in no way any correlation to what he actually said. Sometimes they cross over, but that can be easily explained. The Gospels were in circulation. They were lying about the title the author. And if you don't have to go further than the cover to realize they're not telling me the truth, then why do I have to keep going on to the first verse? Right. And the same thing for the Gospel of Judas. It directly contradicts the idea of there being one God. It directly contradicts the claims that Jesus made about him being the only way to the Father. It directly contradicts the idea of the resurrection and so forth. And you Judas was the hero because he was releasing Jesus from the physical body that was keeping him from being pure spirit. That was the mindset of the cannibals and Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. too. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. if we're going to make a comparison and contrast, you you can read it and realize this is bogus, or you could Johnny Depp kind of thing here. Yeah. yeah, you can dismiss this all from the title alone. If they lied about the author and they lied about the one who, well, yeah author's the one who wrote it, then you can already conclude that this individual not only wasn't alive at the time of these writings, but also didn't get their information straight. That's fine if it's fiction, right? But it is a problem if you're putting this forward as gospel truth. The first, well, the, all the books of Enoch were never claimed to be scripture. They were never written by Enoch, and the only reason they were considered a part of the Bible a hundred and, what, fifty years after the establishment of the biblical canon was because they couldn't come up with good answers on their radio programs to answer the questions that the reformers were asking. Right. So if you make up new Bibles in order to answer critics, you're the problem. But if, on the other hand, you look at these books, read them, and realize there's a difference between this Bible and those, that's what we should ultimately say as far as their significance. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as far as the Apocrypha goes, it's included in the Catholic Bible because of the Council of Trent and so on. Uh, but uh, there, we don't want to categorically throw out any, uh, any and all benefit 
from these books. As we mentioned, First Maccabees is very interesting history. Uh, it's uh, interesting to kind of see the uh, attitude towards spirituality that was going on uh, between the time of the Testaments and so on. But they're definitely, decidedly not divinely inspired. Uh, just the, the, the night and day difference uh, when you, uh, you read through them. Uh, and so uh, people that uh, need to, you know, say, justify things like uh, the selling of indulgences. In other words, you could uh, purchase in advance forgiveness for a sin you were planning uh, on committing. Well, there's no scriptural basis for that, so you've got to uh, come up with something else. So uh, that's why we don't really recommend them. All right, and uh, here's another question from Carolyn who wants to know what the Passion Translation is and uh, if it should be recommended as good reading. Um, Carolyn, when it comes to translations, there's generally two that you're going to run into apart from the cultic writings, which Peter and I have discussed in the New World Translation, deliberate mistranslation. The Passion Translation is what you would call a dynamic equivalent. The author's taken creative liberties to try to communicate the meaning of the passage rather than the word-for-word -word transmission of the passage. So you have word-for-word -word translations, things like the uh, New King James translation. New American the, Standard, the ESV. Yeah. yeah, those are the ones that we'd recommend for personal study. Now, if you read a Bible that's dynamic equivalent, recognize that it can still contain some good insights into Scripture, but it's entirely based on whether the translator got the point right. Like the New Living Translation would be an idea of dynamic equivalent and so on. You know, the Passion Translation kind of takes it out there. I guess, you know, if you wanted to, uh, you know, move away from like the straight and narrow, the NIV is a, uh, is a good dynamic equivalent translation because the goal behind it is to put things in a way that a modern reader can better understand it. New Living is sort of a step away from that. It, it, is more accessible, obviously, but kind of plays fast and loose with a lot of the, the uh, scripture thing. The Passion uh, translation, again, uh, a step farther away from that. You know, maybe the best way to explain this dynamic equivalence that we're talking about here is, uh, you know, when I first got saved, someone gave me a living Bible, and I didn't really know the difference. It just seemed like the Bible to me, so I started reading it. It was very helpful to me. Uh, but I noticed that uh, there were all these footnotes marks in it and I kept looking down at the margin and kept seeing the word implied over and over again. Well what that ended up uh, leading me to discover was that uh, the Living Bible in a number of different places isn't giving you what the word for word the scripture is. It's giving you what Kenneth Taylor, the guy who put together the Living Bible's take is on a particular passage of scripture and uh, and so you know as I became more mature in my walk with God and more familiar with the scripture you know I wanted to have a translation that was kind of getting back to what the original had to say and that should always be our greatest desire it doesn't mean that uh, you can't go on some uh, website like Bible Hub or Blue Letter Bible and compare and contrast these different translations and see if it sheds some light I think that's fine but uh, I really highly, more highly recommend a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible that's easily accessible like the New King James rather than something like the Passion. And if this guy says he's going to add a book to the Bible, boy, uh, I'd stay as far away from that as I possibly could. Hey, thanks so much for joining us on the broadcast. Back tomorrow for more of your questions on God's Word. Tell then, Scott Richards for Sean Richards wishing you a great rest of your day in the Lord. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.